Good evening and a very warm welcome to all of our intellects and thinkers and a very warm welcome to our friends from the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation in South Africa. It is wonderful to have you all here once again for what is actually the penultimate lecture in the Pan-African Pantheon series, a series that has taken a critical look at the most prominent prophets, poets and philosophers in Pan-African history. A special mention must be made of our comrade and friend, Dr. Adeke Adebajo, for assembling such a stellar lineup of global African intelligentsia to compile a body of literature that gives us the depth and breadth of Pan-Africanism's most important figures in a way that no other work has done to date. I am of course referring to his book, The Pan-African Pantheon, which personally has been an absolute pleasure reading over the last few weeks, and I'm sure that you all have your copies by now. As many of you already know, my name is Akaita Alfred and I send you very warm greetings from North London this evening. As always, if you are here with us for the first time, it's customary to just tell us where you're logging in from in the chat. It's always really good just to see which parts of the diaspora and indeed the continent that the center has reached. So if you could just let us know your name and location as everyone gets settled, I would be very grateful to see where people are logging in from this evening. So just put your name and where you're uh, logging in to us from this evening. So we have Nigel from Hitchin, UK, thank you. Welcome, Sylvia, Trinidad and Tobago. Warm welcome to you. Anyone else? We've got John in St. Lucia, fellow countryman of Vlad Lucien. Welcome. Okay, Mukhetsi from Johannesburg. I've uh, got Elizabeth from Cape Town, welcome. Bassi, feel like that's a, a fellow countryman of mine from Boston, welcome. Anyone else wanna let us know where they're coming from? Hi again to you from Berlin, hello, Eric from London, Renee from Washington, We've got Livingston, hello from Tottenham, North London, welcome. Okay, amazing. You can keep putting those in, I will keep checking. Thank you to everyone that let us know where they're coming from. So on behalf of everyone at the Center of Pan-African Thought and the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation, I just want to say it's a pleasure to have you here and I hope that you leave tonight's lecture feeling inspired, enthused and keen to find out more about our pantheon for tonight, which is poet and playwright Derek Walcott. His name may not necessarily be one of the first that comes to mind when we think of Pan-Africanism, However, tonight's lecture will shine a light on the work of a man whose intricate metaphorical poetry captured the physical beauty of the Caribbean, the harsh legacy of colonialism, and the complexities of living and writing in two cultural worlds, and also earned him a Nobel Prize in literature. So now let me introduce you to tonight's guest speaker. Vladimir Lucien is a writer, actor, and critic. His writing has been widely published, including in an anthology of Caribbean poetry and prose entitled Beyond Sangre Gran. His debut collection, Sounding Ground, won him the OCM Bacchus Prize for Caribbean Literature in 2015. He is the co-editor of the anthology St. Lisi, Poems and Art of St. Lucia, and is the screenwriter of the documentary The Americans, which premiered at the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival in 2013. So just to remind everybody of how the evening will be structured, Vladimir is going to present for about 35 to 40 minutes. He and I will then enter into a conversation for another 20 minutes or so, just to unpick some of the key themes from his chapter in the book. It will then be time for the Q&A where I will be moderating and you will have the opportunity to ask your questions directly to Vladimir or to pitch them in the chat for me to field them on your behalf if you prefer. So as usual, questions will be asked in rounds of two or three at a time. All I ask is that you stay on mute until the time comes for you to speak. When that time comes, I'll just ask you to raise your virtual hand and wait until you're called. So without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Vladimir Lucien. Vladimir, it's over to you for the next 35 or 40 minutes. Okay, hopefully I last that long. <laughs> um, okay, thank you for having me. Um, thank you to everyone who's here, some people who, who I know, including my teachers, mentors, and so forth, 
Um, I noticed are also in attendance. Um, thank you to the, the Institute um, as well. I remember fondly the conference that started this, this, this collection um, a few years ago in South Africa in Joburg. And um, I also want to remember two people who, who are in this book that I remember that I, I, I don't know, I can't keep track, but there are two people I know who are in this book who have gone to strengthen us on the other side um, and who I had the pleasure of interacting with, um, who are um, Professor Abiola Irele, um, really great scholar, um, as well as um, Dr. Elise Brown. Um, so just recognizing them as contributors as well um, in, in, in the book and in bigger ways as well. My focus, the focus of, of, of the lecture it's really going to be going, I hope everybody's getting the book, but it's, it's, it's primarily going to be looking at the strength of a figure like Walter within the, the, within the idea of Pan-Africanism. And what's important about that is he's not the first person who comes to mind when we think about Pan-Africanism in the Caribbean. I'm sure persons who are attending from the Caribbean would think um, quicker of Campbell Brathwaite because as I'll point out, um, because the focus of the lecture is on the muse of history um, coming out of that, that very heady period of the um, black consciousness in the Caribbean would have been, um, Walker would have been pitted against Brathwaite <laughs> who was seen as the one who was more Pan-African, more representative of um, Africa in the Caribbean than Walker. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting to have that kind of, have Walker thrown in from left field. And I think there's something about him his work, his experience of that time that tempers um, perhaps what certain uh, tendencies within, within the Black Power movement and challenges it in the same way that it challenged him. And I think my lecture is, well, my, my lecture, I say a lecture, but it's really, I'm going to be talking, I have my notes and so on, but it's the pandemic and I'm on a couch. <laughs> so, um, but the point is that it's, it's going to be focused more, a, a lot about how this period of time enriched Walcott's own sense of self, and it helped him to produce work that enriched our own thinking about the Caribbean, our own thinking about the place of movements like um, Black Power and, and something like the Pan-African movement, um, which he's now kind of formed a part of through this book, through our kind of thinking about him again in that period of time. Um, my reflection on it started very in a very personal way in that this was a lecture. This was a, a, a an essay, the Muse of History, which is a very famous essay by Walcott in his collection, um, in his collection, What the Twilight Says. It was a difficult. Uh, it was difficult for me to read it because it was so critical of Black Power at the time, um, and it seemed to me there was a lack of of sympathizing with what was happening um, on the part of Walcott, and it took me really reading it again and again and again to start to, 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 to pick out what I think was of greater use in the essay than what caused offense. Um, I will, as I did also in the essay, give very brief kind of bio, biographical details about Walker, just to introduce him in a way a little bit. You have already, um, but just a very brief bio something, and then I will go into the issue at hand, which is that Muse of History um, essay. All right, so Walcott was born in 1930, January 23rd in Castries, St. Lucia, and he died uh, March 17th, 2017, which I, I like to say was the day after my birthday, and it really was. Um, he was one of the most celebrated playwrights in the Caribbean and one of the world's most celebrated poets. He received the Nobel Prize in 1992. Uh, he's one of three Nobel laureates, if I'm correct, in the Caribbean, via Snipal and St. John Purse being the others. He was a great citizen of the English language as well as a great citizen of the Caribbean or the West Indies. And this biographical detail is of interest um, in terms of what I'm going to cover. It's Walcott published his first poem at 14 in a local newspaper. And it was, it was also the site of his first confrontation with grand narratives because his, I'm sorry about the New York noise. I'm in the best room in the house, but hopefully you're hearing me well. He, it was his first confrontation with grand narratives and what they come with, what they tend to come with. Um, because his poem was, he, he, he got a bit of a reprimand for that poem in heroic couplets, no less, from a priest on the island who was 
uh, very dogmatic and didn't like Walcott's expressions of kind of identifying with and feeling deep kind of connections with Nietzsche and with landscape and things like that, that smarted um, of paganism to, to the priest and he replied to it. Um, Walcott went on to publish a uh, uh, prodigious body of work um, and, and he, he just, he's right now one of our icons, you know, and, and ancestors, great ancestors in the Caribbean and the world. He has, you know, attracted the admiration of people um, far outside of the Caribbean, outside of Africa, um, all over the world. In the Muse of History, in, in Walcott's essay, Walcott seems to be at first in defense mode, as he, he should have been, because he did come under attack at that time. Um, many, of, many people who were now claiming Black consciousness um, and, and claiming it as a source from which they could also produce work uh, as an aesthetic source and so forth with, it, with these connections to Africa as well, and also with the work of Brathwaite showing how it could get done as well, Walcott came under attack. And the attack was one that was questioning his authenticity. And what I'm arguing is that that question to his authenticity is also a question of his reality, um, I, I, his realness, because in a sense, who wants to be in, inauthentic anyway? You know, What kind of existence is that? And since this was a choice of reality, it became a threat of greater magnitude than what it would have seemed because if it's threatening now to make you illegible within your culture, to make you unintelligible in that culture or unwanted or inauthentic, it is now putting Walcott into something of a kind of spiritual survival mood where he, he needs to defend himself. And what I want to look at is the gestures he takes and the lessons of those gestures for us in defending himself. On, on one end, and I said at the beginning of this that he was a great citizen of the English language. He saw himself in the mighty line of Milton and Marlowe, but he also saw himself as absolutely a West Indian writer. These are his words. He also had to face within the Caribbean something very similar. There was a very similar attack on the Caribbean generally as he was feeling during Black Power, which is the idea of being nothing, the idea of not being legible in a sense. And that that attack on the Caribbean, if you want to call it, um, the two of its chief perpetrators were um, the historian, the English historian, James Anthony Froud, I think it's how it's pronounced, and um, V.S. Naipaul. Um, they're famous for these statements that kind of, um, that kind of place onto the Caribbean, um, the identity of the void, the identity of being nothing. So um, Froud is famous for saying, there are no people there in the Caribbean with a character and purpose of their own, right? Um, Walker, um, Naipaul was famous for saying, history is built around creation and achievement and nothing was created in the West Indies. So this idea of void hovers over the Caribbean and it's coming both from inside and outside, Naipaul and Fraud. And Walcott is starting to note in that essay that there are similar kind of parameters being offered to him now in this attack, I, ironically, um, in, in having to confront Black power in his own part of the world. It's, it's no longer a matter of a foreign episteme being imposed there. It's actually something that's happening locally. So um, there is one of Walcott's responses um, is in another life. So he's saying basically the idea is history is around creation and achievement. That's a particular way of seeing, there's a particular way of seeing that creation and achievement, of course, it's, it's culturally and provincially determined. And, and so Walcott is seeing something similar happening to him here. So we have um, what one Caribbean writer had called the satanic verses of another life, I think is what he used. He said, um, he's, he's quoted, I'm quoting him here in response to black power. This is from another life. He says, those who peel from their own leprous flesh their names, who chafe and nurture the scars of rusted chains like primates favoring scabs, those who charge tickets for another free ride on the Middle Passage, those who explain the, to the peasant why he is African, their catamites and eunuchs banging tambourines, whores with slave bangles banging tambourines, and the academics crouched like rats listening to tambourines. So you could tell the acerbity in these lines. Um, Eddie Bohr, Professor Eddie Bohr, um, saw the muse of history as what he called the discursive theoretical twin of chapter 22 of Another Life. Um, 
a point borne out by the fact that chapter 22 actually was called the muse of history at Rampanalgas. And it is also related to, but for me, it's related also to chapter 19, where these kind of excoriations um, of black power are. And Walcott excoriates and mocks black power in that chapter, pointing to the very irony of, of it offering similar, it being black, um, black power, similar, similarly limiting um, kind of parameters, similar degradations and limitations through its espousal of an identical convention of history. So even though the content was different, the convention of history was the same. There was still this idea of kind of pointing to black creation and achievement according to how it was understood by a certain group of people, according to how creation and achievement was understood. Um, so, and, he, and this, is, this is Walcott speaking of this here and listen clearly to these lines. They measure the skulls with calipers, you know, an evocation of the phrenology and the kind of, you know, theorizations or pseudoscience of determining black criminality or, or stupidity or whatever via measuring skulls and, and you know, um, phenotypical kind of features. And so he goes on to say, and pronounce their measure after me measuring the skulls and pronounce their measure of toms, of traitors, of traditionals and Afro-Saxons. They measure them carefully as others measure the teeth of men and horses. They measure and divide, right? And so he's, so if you notice here, all of these things, these images that evoke um, what would have happened during colonization from a foreign group of people um, meeting out that treatment to African and African descended people. He's saying that this is the same thing happening in black power in that sense of measuring, in that sense of, even in, in terms of their historiography, their way of kind of seeing things. So here Walcott's parts ways, and he parts ways via a certain kind of uh, fraught relationship with history and, and, and departing or, or leaving history in favor of myth. And, and it's important for us to understand what conception of myth that he espouses and, um, and how it is of use to him. So I, another personal note is that I came back to the Muse of History with a, a, a much better reading of it after encountering um, a quote from Sun Ra, and I'm gonna quickly read it. Sun Ra, the jazz musician um, from, from, from the US, from Alabama. He says, and a lot of things black people dealing with have proven to be not profitable. Of course, they try to base things on truth, but the truth is no longer acceptable, you see, not to the creator, because when they took Christ and put him on the cross, he said, I am the truth and they eliminated the truth. You see, you're dealing with cosmic equations. So when he says, I am the truth and they crucified him, they crucified truth. It doesn't exist anymore. So you can't use it. If you do, you'll be just like it. So what you have now, you got to deal with myth particularly the black race, they got to stop everything and realize whatever they're doing is not profitable. Don't care if it's righteous, don't care if it's the truth, it's not doing anything. So when they have to deal with some, so, so now they have to deal with something else, deal with myth. So you notice this kind of um, separation of, 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 of truth and myth, all right? Um, if Black Power did something productive for Walcott, it is in how he seemed to take it personally as an affront and as an attack and his on his reality on his realness and it forced him to mount a, a resistance to the limitations he felt were being imposed upon him by their convention of history by their approach to things so beyond that social and historical truth that was being foisted upon him he had to access something within himself more elemental something deeper and perhaps visceral it is through this collision of an imposed social history and the inward reach for personal history or myth that this emerges. And it's of, it's of, um, it's of I, I should say as well that the, the title of my essay in the collection is The Myth of My Own Self. The idea of creating a myth for oneself and, and as something empowering for one. Um, the other, I, I also wanted to kind of allude to the fact that this is very similar to something in Black um, African American um, writing where the Moynihan reports that, you know, had, had, was so, so very, kind of socially deterministic uh, and that many black writers wrote against, albeit not in the way that Walcott did necessarily, but it's this idea of history, sociology and these things being very deterministic. And it's not just the history, but the, the, the historiography, the way of seeing history, the way of writing history. And that necessitates the writing of personal myth. So to Walcott, and there's a long quote here, but I won't go into it. 
he's talking about, he, he calls something Afro-Aryanism. He's talking about during that time, um, the idea of anything adulterated, anything that was less than, he, he, anything that was like an unsoiled black would not be tolerated and so on. But he's talking about the benefits of that in terms of the response it creates. And he describes it partly as um, people who become exotic hybrids, who favor more complex values. Um, and he compares such people to islands. Now, if Walcott has made any kind of historical statement on himself using the facts of history, it's been this very famous quote um, from, I, I'm forgetting the name, it's not the spoilers return, it's Shabin. Um, but the quote goes, I know these islands from Monos to Nassau, a rusty head sailor with sea green eyes that they nicknamed Shabin, the patois for any red nigger who loved the sea. I had a sound colonial education. I have Dutch, nigger, and English in me, and either I'm nobody or a nation, or I'm a nation. Either I'm nobody, you notice this sense of, of tussling with the void and that imposition of it, or I'm a nation, right? Um, so this is Walker tussling with his historical self before we get into the myth he creates for his own self. One of the attitudes of Walker is he has a kind of acceptance for um, the creation of the present. Um, even the so-called destructive or antagonistic forces of the past, he understands them as all ultimately being creative towards what is strong, uh, even what is strong and even some things that may be strong and good in the present, as well as I think he acknowledges how they have been creative of, of persistent um, evils as well. But he's, he's also, he maintains a complexity of vision by understanding even the destructive forces of the past, perhaps in spite of themselves and beyond themselves, also having creative charge, right? Um, he accepts this. So he says, I, he says, for example, I think that precisely because of their limitations, our early education must have ranked to the finest in the world. The grounding was rigid, a Latin, Greek, and the essential masterpieces, but there was this elation of discovery. Shakespeare, Marlowe, Horace, Virgil, these writers weren't jaded by immediate experiences. The atmosphere was competitive, creative. It was cruel, but it created our literature. So he recognizes the, the past, even its destructive elements as being creative. He says, I feel absolutely no shame in having endured the colonial experience. There was no obvious humiliation in it. In fact, I think that many of what are sneered at as colonial values are part of the strength of the West Indian psyche a fusion of formalism with exuberance, a delight in both the precision and the power of language. We love rhetoric and this, this has created a style, a panache about life that is particularly ours. Our most tragic folk songs and our most self-critical calypsos have a driving life-asserting force. Combine that in our literature with a long experience of classical forms and you're bound to have something exhilarating. So not only does he prioritize this, but the other thing that Walcott does after dealing with this history and dealing with even the kind of very strong European provincial notions of what um, achievement and creation are um, and what they constitute and how th these things become what history is, he, along with doing that, he's also recognizing that the past does not have a monopoly on creative power. And, and, and he recognizes that as one of the one of part of the idea, the philosophy of history, the idea of, of a unilateral kind of um, creative uh, acting upon of the past toward the present, right? The present kind of just as yielding out of the past and it's, it's whatever has taken place there. In starting to, to, to relinquish that, that, that history and that, that approach to history, he's very much trying to create a situation, trying to create a myth and um, a rationale even perhaps to, for the recognition also of the creative imperative of the present, the fact of it not being a unilateral relationship at all. And history cannot help him with that. History and the historiography that goes along with it, history with a capital H, history as it is provincially conceived and internationally exported by a certain group of people did not afford him that. And he's thinking also that this is the same historiography in a sense that is there even within black power to some extent, that whether we're talking about the greatness of the Romans or the greatness of the black Egyptians, we're still kind of linked to a particular philosophy of history, one which he thinks 
has particular limitations. And what helps Walcott, apart from the formation of his own myth, is his experience of himself as a writer um, in starting to, to outline the contours of that, resistant, that position of resistance that he's going to mount. It is, it is that very kind of, call it mystical or whatever, experience of being a writer itself that really arms him to create something um, that is a worthy kind of alternative to that philosophy of history. The first part of it is that Walcott starts this idea of the, um, the Adamic, Eden, you know, almost creating a kind of blank slate in the Caribbean. Um, and for, this is something um, for which he received a lot of criticism. But there's an interesting quote from Walcott um, where he is talking about, he's giving thanks to his, to both worlds um, in the muse of history. And he says, he says, I give the strange and bitter and yet ennobling thanks for the monumental groaning and soldering of two great worlds like the halves of a fruit seamed by its own bitter juice that exiled from your own Edens, you have placed me in the wonder of another. And that was my inheritance and your gift. He's acknowledging other Edens. It's, so this is not within the, the, the trajectory of history, the, the, the teleological um, trajectory of history or that very deterministic um, teleology of history. What he's looking at is the recursive world of myth where the relationship between the past and the present is one of recursivity, is one almost as parallels. Um, so, so Africa and Europe or wherever he's referring to constitute Edens themselves. And so too is the Caribbean and Eden, even while it is something else, even while it is the product of other Edens. The other thing is, it's a necessity. It's an active, it's, it's, it's an act of resistance as well, and an act, a, an act of survival to create these, um, these myths as well, because he's creating not only a myth for himself, but his context. So his context is one where he's creating within it the possibility um, in which the creativity of the present has equal status as that of the past. I think George Lamming had talked about piles of, of, of creation and achievement. Um, that kind of morass of, of ruins and so forth that somehow symbolize um, creation and achievement and therefore history. What Walcott does is create something where the past or older civilizations cannot necessarily have um, greater prominence than a newer civilization like ours. We, in the Caribbean, you, you can't claim to be um, an ancient civilization in its current constitution. So how do you avoid within that philosophy of history being marginalized as a nation without history? One of the ways you do it is that rejection of history and that espousal of myth, which because it's recursive in its relationship to the past creates a, a kind of equality between the past and the present. And one that is innovating in a way that it allows the present to not solely be the product and therefore the victim of, of the forces of the past. So it's an incredibly complex and an incredibly, um, I think, productive philosophy as well. So I'll, I'll focus the remainder of my time. I'm not sure how long I've been going on, but uh, I, I'm gonna be close to finish, not far from now. Um, but I want to focus on how his experience of a writer allowed him to have a particular relationship with myth, allowed him to have a particular relationship um, where he could relinquish this idea of history and take on something that for him was more transformative, something that was more empowering. In his experience as a writer, he, and I call this part of the essay, the spiritual self, right? Uh, and I, I also want to mention the fact that Walker did not see, you know, history is bound up a lot with the actions of politicians of one sense or another, whether kings and, and, and queens of the past, um, the tragic heroes of, of, of these, and or the politicians of the present. Walcott saw art playing a particular role in this, in terms of the Caribbean. He says, for example, in the Caribbean, we do not pretend to exercise power in the historical sense. I think that what our politicians define as power, the need for it or the lack of it should have another name that like America, what energizes our society is the spiritual force of a culture shaping itself. And it can do this without the formula of politics. 
Um, so I think that's one of the things that needs to be borne in mind. I think he also says the future of West Indian militancy lies in art. So he's not speaking of these kind of grand narrative and the changes of these grand narratives that we often look for in terms of liberation, in terms of any philosophy of freedom and liberation. He's talking about a liberation of the people themselves, um, which he believes is not the sole province, is not um, solely achieved through political movement, but he sees a special um, possibility for that happening through art. So I go on to what I was um, talking about, which is the spiritual self. Now, I ask myself the question, how does he think about this? He says himself, in, in the Muse of History, it is this awe of the numinous, this elemental privilege of naming the new world which annihilates history in our great poets, an elation common to all of them, whether they are aligned by heritage to Crusoe or Prospero or to Friday and Caliban. They reject ethnic ancestry for faith in elemental man. Walker is aware that he's creating a myth here, but he recognizes that as part of what life is about and part of even what history is about, even though it won't say so, right? Um, so what is his deeper sense of himself as a writer? So one of the things that he says in another life, there's this famous scene where he is overcome with feeling. Um, he becomes almost one with the landscape. He says, what I described in another life about being on the hill and feeling the sort of dissolution that happened is a frequent experience in a younger writer. I felt this sweetness of melancholy, of melancholy, of a sense of mortality, of ra or rather immortality, a sense of gratitude, both for what you feel is a gift and for the beauty of the earth, the beauty of life around us. When that's forceful in a young writer, it can make you cry. It's just clear tears. It's not grimacing or being contorted. It's just the flow that happens. The body feels it is melting into what it has seen. This continues in the poet. It may be repressed in some way, but I think we continue in all our lives to have that sense of melting, of the I not being important. That is one part of it. What is increasingly clear is Walcott starts to espouse at least one aspect of the self, his experience as a writer, as being a sort of vessel who is at one with the past by virtue of being that vessel, he is collapsing that boundary between the past and the present and creating a relationship of, of mutual extension between the past and the present, thereby debunking history's tendency to give the past um, a, sort of, a sort of kind of deterministic authority over the present, and therefore also to give older civilizations a sense of superiority to um, younger civilizations like that of the Caribbean, who are seen as third world, for example. He says, in terms of, talk, he's talking about a poem and the creation of the poem and the silence and so on and forgetting about the traffic outside and so forth. And the fact that he prays and, and says thanks after writing a poem. He says, between the beginning and ending and the actual composition that goes on, there is a kind of trance that you hope to enter where every aspect of your intellect is functioning simultaneously for the progress of the composition. What Walcott is espousing here is some of the poetics of African religion, of black religion. So ironically, even as he is seen as a Tom perhaps or a traitor within the black consciousness movement, which is very, very political, not to say it did not have a spiritual arm, but a lot of what we saw of it was that very strong political arm, which is linked in terms of its espousal of the same historiography as those that, as, as its detractors and as its, its opponents. He's espousing here without claiming it in that way, or maybe even unwittingly, the poetics of black religion, of trance, of the self as vessel for the ancestors and for the past, right? He says here, where is it, of his dad, he sees himself as a continuation of his dad, the work of his father being extended through him. He says of his father's death, now that didn't make me a morose or morbid child, rather in a sense, it gave me a kind of impetus and a strong sense of continuity. I felt that what had been cut off in him somehow was an extension that I was continuing. Again, self as vessel, again, the self in the present as a necessity of the past for its extension, for its perpetuation, a kind of relationship of mutuality between the past and the present, not one of unilateral domination or authority. 
Another very interesting quote, and this might be one of the last ones I look at, is in the Muse of History, he says something else, which I'm going to read. This espousal of the spiritual self is directly connected to the convention of history that Walker articulated in the Muse of History. This is why ideas of originality and imitation never bothered him much because he believed that these ideas gain relevance within a history based on chronological time, which sees originality as the preserve of the past. With myth, on the other hand, the present and past are simultaneous with each other. Of Romare Bearden, the African-American um, artist and um, collagist, he says, it is a patronizing way of saying about Romare's work. Oh, look at those black cutouts. They are like Greek vases. Yes, they may be like Greek vases, but they are simultaneous concepts, not chronological concepts. The black cutout of a diving figure is no more historical than the silhouette of a Greek athlete on a vase. It's not a question of where you stop, since you then have to go from the Greek silhouette back to the Egyptian profile, etc. If you think of art merely in terms of chronology, you are going to be patronizing to certain cultures. But if you think of art as a simultaneity that is inevitable in terms of certain people, then Joyce is the contemporary of Homer. And so too is he the contemporary of Homer in Omeros, he talks about meeting Homer, um, you know, visualizing it. Um, he says, I saw you in London, I said, sunning on the steps of St. Martin in the fields, your dog-eared manuscript clutched in your heaving chest. The cues at the bus stops smiled at your seaman's shuffle and a, cur and a curate kicked you until you waddled down to the summary themes. That's because I'm a heathen. They don't know my age. Even nightingales have forgotten their names. The goat declines head down with these rocks for a stage bare of tragedy. The Aegean chimera is a camera. You get my drift? A drifter is the hero of my book. I never read it. I said, not all the way through. This is him talking about meeting Homer. He's one of his heroes. And Walker sees no difference between channeling Homer and channeling a contemporary like Robert Lowell. Right? He was not based on this idea of originality. And I would, I would like persons to also recall Zora Neale Hurston talking about the the black sense of, ident of, of originality is not one of chronology either. It's one of modifying what already exists and bringing it, representing it in an original way. And I think it is in this kind of espousal of spirituality and its poetics and what it allows um, for a relationship between the past and the present as one where the wall could be easily collapsed in a moment and these reveal themselves to be simultaneous with each other that in that Walcott finds something that combats that history, in that he finds something that allows him a certain breadth of existence that that notion of, of uh, Black consciousness he felt he was facing did not. And he recognized his ability to experience that within whatever identity he was a part of, within whatever complex of identity, that identity itself is a complex and a kind of confluence of, of, of influences of the past and the present, the past towards the present and the present towards the past, right? And I think this complexity is well captured in something um, Caribbean writer, uh, novelist, scholar um, said about Walcott just after his death. And that's Earl Lovelace. He said, so at the end, his followers embraced him not because they could follow where he led, or embrace what he said, but because in a way he had been all, been everything. And that is what he remained, a work in progress guided by his own talent and genius and love. And that is where I will end my presentation. <laughs>